What's up, everyone? Welcome to part two on our series on understanding wokeness and postmodernism. I want to introduce myself. I didn't do it in the last video. My name is Hovik Arshaguni. I'm an American of Armenian descent, and I'm the descendant of survivors who fled the Armenian genocide perpetrated by Ottoman Turkey during World War I against its Armenian population. I think that may be a part of my personal history that made me very sensitive a few years ago when I saw some of this nonchalant characterization of people into various groups and the assigning of a moral valence to those groups. Anyhow, let's proceed. In the last video, I tried to bombard us with an assortment of strange phenomena that were happening in the world for those who may not have been paying attention. I think it's difficult to understand any of that phenomena without understanding wokeness and postmodernism. So at this point, I'd like to lay out my thesis. Postmodernism slash wokeness can largely be thought of in three phases. One, there is a philosophical phase in the 1960s and 70s where a group of largely French philosophers conceived of a radically different worldview than we'd ever seen before. Two, a phase in the 80s and 90s and beyond in which activist scholars took this worldview and used it as the foundational bedrock vision for a blossoming of a whole host of academic disciplines. I'm talking about things like critical race theory, critical queer theory, women's studies, whiteness studies, fat studies, and on and on. Over the decades, they built ideas on top of ideas, largely without any academic rigor, leading to papers such as this. Glaciers, gender, and science. And the second sentence here in the abstract says, the relationships among gender, science, and glaciers, particular, particularly related to epistemological questions about the production of glaciological knowledge, remain understudied. This paper goes on to describe essentially an art project in which a piece of ice melts on a vinyl record and as it melts it alters the sound of the vinyl record. And this is meant to be a valid alternative way of gaining a knowledge about glaciers. I'm going to break all of that down in later videos. And finally there's the third phase in which we can call wokeness in which so many people have been indoctrinated into this worldview that it was inevitable that we would see a lot of these weird actions piling up. We would begin to see some of these conflicts of one worldview conflicting with another, which is that of the society we exist in now. In this video, I'm only going to talk about the first phase, the philosophical conception, to help us try to understand how these philosophers saw the world. So we're really in the 60s and 70s era. These postmodernists were inher inheritors of a long tradition of Marxist theory. Occasionally, it's going to be useful to refer back to Marxism in order to understand how the postmodernists saw things differently. If you're able to stay focused, I think you'll be very intellectually rewarded. Uh, this is deep, but it's not super difficult to understand, I think. You're going to be rewarded because once you are able to put this framework on and see the world through its eyes, all of the weird phenomena, some of the stuff that we discussed in the last video, some of the things you may be seeing out there, will make perfect sense, even though I haven't yet made the parts where I describe how they blossomed and became widespread in academia. That being said, let's begin. The postmodernists really brought two key ideas to the table. One, oppressive, tyrannical power is constantly operating on us through everyone and everything and every institution and every idea. Number two, there are no meta-narratives. Let's tackle the second point first. Before we understand what a meta-narrative is, let's try to understand a narrative. A narrative is just a story. And we all have our own story. From the events in our past and our projections about the future, we build an idea of where we expect our lives to go and what our lives means. We build meaning, meaning out of this. 
Meta-narratives are the stories that society is telling us to construct meaning. So one example of this is Christianity. For Christians, for thousands of years until the present day, the story of Christianity gives some sort of framework to life, to society, how to behave. It's a meta-narrative that instructs people on how to live and gives widespread meaning to everything. You can think of meta-narratives as either one narrative with multiple different parallel streams, or you can think of them as uh, various overlapping different narratives that exist in society. Literally anything. So, the legal system. We have certain ideas about the legal system. We understand how the rule of law developed, how the idea of punishment and justice developed throughout history, through various thinkers and applications in different societies. And from this we craft a meta-narrative about how the legal system works and why ours has a certain value as compared to others. Same thing with liberalism. And I'm not talking about the liberal conservative distinction in American politics. I'm talking about hundreds of years of liberal, political, and philosophical thinking that led to ideas like human rights, equality under the law, enlightenment values, logic, rationality, reason, science, some people might think science has done all this progress and given us knowledge about the world, but for the postmodernists that wasn't the case. It was simply one meta-narrative of many interpretations of reality that were possible. And you could have a completely different society with different values and ideas, and there'd be no way to make a comparison of the two. You could never say one was better than the other. You could never say some sort of truth or value judgment was better than another one. To really understand this, we have to think about Marxism for a moment. These thinkers were profoundly disappointed with Marxism because Marx had come along and said, I have unmasked capitalism as a conflict between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. The workers of the world will unite and instigate a communist revolution and we will all be liberated. But by the 1960s it was clear that this wasn't happening. Everywhere that Marxist doctrine had spread had ended in widespread terror, totalitarianism, and the bodies were piling up. By some estimates, the 20th century saw a hundred million people dead to communist regimes. And this affected the postmodernists, and they were disappointed and basically saying, it's all subjective. There is no truth. There is no real way to get liberated. Every society does its own thing. The second idea here is that literally everything is masking oppressive, tyrannical power dynamics and structures that we can't see and we're all being indoctrinated into all of the time. In order to understand this, again we have to refer to Karl Marx. Marx had said famously, you may recall, religion is the opium of the masses. In other words, saying the bourgeoisie, the, the rich, the owners of capital, have invented this myth of religion in order to keep you in your chains. They've invented this myth of nationalism to keep you in your chains. But the postmodernists looked at it a little differently. It wasn't some Illuminati type conspiracy of the rich invented religion. Rather, they saw it as the whole system pulsing and indoctrinating us into how power works all of the time. Every meta narrative that we had in society was telling us how power worked, teaching us how to enact power and be subjected to power. So, to be clear, they weren't saying that there are no meta-narratives, necessarily. Every society has its own. But there's nothing special about, about the one society is telling us. You could literally have one with the exact opposites, and it would all still be valid. No way to judge one over the other. And these two gems are really all we need to craft how the postmodernists saw the world. So, let's do that. Let's try to synthesize that together. First, Humans are complete blank slates born into society. Now you might say, wait, we know some things about human beings. But the truth is, the postmodernists would say, no, you don't. 
You only know them through science or the study of evolution or what religions might tell us. You don't really know anything because we don't believe these meta-narratives to be truth. They're just subjective expressions of power in society. So human beings are blank slates. They're born into society. And since everywhere is pulsing with this hidden power, it's basically writing into our hard drives, our brains, how to think about power, how to reenact power. It's writing the same story in everyone's head, but from different perspectives. So for some people, it's telling them, you are the powerful group. You are powerful. You are the dominant group. So back then they might have said, society is telling men to grow up to be powerful and dominant. And women are growing up to believe men are powerful and dominant and that they in turn are submissive and domestic. That could be one idea they said it. That's on the axis of male, female, or men and women. But in fact, it was operating on every axis of race, of wealth, of everything. Take this desk. Someone manufactured this desk, a supply chain delivered it, and I purchased it. This whole system masks inherent power and exploitation. The basic equation would be, take X, subtract the meta-narrative away, and what you see is power structures and exploitation unmasked. And that's it. That's how the postmodernists saw the world. But in order to appreciate it, you really need to put on your glasses because right now you are holding ideas that you might think are universal principles or that you can prove that they're good, but the postmodernists would say, no, no, no. That's just subjective propaganda that society has convinced you to believe, to keep you in your chains. So for example, we might say, well, that can't be true for everything. I mean, we shouldn't kill people, right? Like, that's obviously true. Not for the postmodernists. If a society developed that took killing as a virtue, the postmodernists would be unable to say one culture was better than another. And really, it's as simple as that. I mean, of course, there's more nuance, but that is fundamentally the postmodern philosophical view of the world and how it emerged. Now let's try to dance with this idea a little bit by comparing it to the liberal framework that we live in and see how it differs. And by liberal, I don't mean the liberal conservative distinction in contemporary American politics to distinguish between Democrats and Republicans. What I'm talking about is the depth of political and philosophic thought that led to the framework of the society that we live in. At the top, we have virtues, human rights, equality, freedom, rationality, reason. And at the bottom we have our vices, authoritarianism, ignorance, tyranny. And society hovers in the middle between these two poles. And we try to push it up by striving to capture these virtues, to apply them in our society. Of course injustice exists, but haven't we used this framework before to overcome some aspects of it? Didn't abolitionists say during the time of slavery that of course these are great principles, but we are not applying them. So much of our population is still in chains based on the color of their skin, and we push society up by breaking those chains. Didn't Martin Luther King echo the words in the Constitution saying, we find these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, but we're not applying this principle to our population who is still segregated, who doesn't have access to voting, and Civil Rights Act was passed, and the Voting Rights Act was passed, and we made progress. But how does the postmodern view differ from this? Everything is pulsing all of the time with its hidden message of propaganda and oppressive power, brainwashing the entire population into upholding certain groups. And in this framework, injustice exists, and therefore everything else that exists at the same time is causing and perpetuating this injustice through its secret messaging. 
Is that postmodern worldview not the only reason that scientific method comes to be associated as an element of whiteness in the Smithsonian infographic that we showed last week? Is that not the only explanation for why this slide from a New York teachers conference has swallowed up the concept of objectivity within white supremacy? Which framework do you want to operate in? Are there no true statements that you believe are worthwhile to uphold? Are there no moral positions or principles that you think deserve primacy over others? And while we're at it, let's talk about this concept of power. Is it necessarily true that all forms of power are 100% oppressive and tyrannical? You grew up in a household. There was a power imbalance in that household. Could 100% of that power be explainable as pure corruption and tyranny? You may work in a company or an institution that has definite power imbalances as a hierarchy. Is the only way to understand that power dynamic as deeply oppressive and exploitative? You need to decide for yourself. My only goal in this series is to highlight how in fact there are two very different frameworks at play that are fundamentally incompatible and will keep coming into conflict with each other. Which one we choose has deep ramifications for how society will unfold going into the future. I want to say one last thing about the postmodernists. I hold no ill will towards them. You can think of them as weed smoking theorists. Could it be that everything is power and oppression? The problem is not the philosophical musing. The problem which we'll get into in future segments is how various academic disciplines have emerged that took these musings and hardened them into givens, into dogmatic visions, and built ideas on top of ideas that festered and ballooned with virtually no serious contact with anything bearing a passing resemblance to academic vigor. Thanks for tuning in. If you're interested in these topics, remember to like and subscribe. I'm always interested in feedback, no matter what kind. Only through open discussion can we actually solve a lot of these problems and push forward. Thank you. Take care.